Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. I'm very delighted to be here this Saturday morning to talk about the history, the construction, and then the reuse or of the PV Plaza site. So thank you again uh, for joining us in this morning and taking some time of your Saturday morning uh, to navigate uh, the history and the reuse of PV Plaza. Those are the three key items I wanted to talk and walk you through today. And as Dick mentioned earlier, I will try to stick my talk to about 45 minutes to make sure we have enough time at the end uh, for 15 minutes for questions and, ans and answering any questions you might have. But the three main items I would like to discuss is uh, first defining an, the problem and some of the challenges that were associated with uh, reactivating and reusing uh, PV Plaza. Then the second step would be to talk about the different tools, uh, historic preservation and planning tools that were implemented uh, to go from uh, the design to the construction and the actual reuse of PV Plaza. Um, and then I will share and spend some time on the actual solution, which is what we can see right now. Of course, it's half covered in snow. Uh, but if you were able to go and enjoy uh, PV Plaza outdoor spaces during the summer, and I will show you some photos, then you will see how the project team and the architect was able to, uh, to solve and incorporate all those design requirements and stakeholder requirements into one single project. But let's start with the problem and where we are. So we are fortunate to be next to PV Plaza. I think it's a great location. Um, so we are talking about uh, downtown Minneapolis. Uh, we are just north of the convention center. Uh, we have the orchestra hall that is also uh, occupying about one third of the city block and the remainder of the block is occupied by Plevi Plaza. Uh, we have the WCCO to the north and for the ones who may know, we have the Brits pub if that still exists <laughs> facing <laughs> Plevi Plaza on Nicolette Mall. We also see on this slide uh, Nicolette Mall. And Nicolette Mall was uh, an incentive from the city that was in 1967. The city wanted to find a way to revitalize and reactivate downtown Minneapolis. So they created Nicolette Mall in 67. And shortly after, in 1974, they hired Paul Friedberg, the architect, landscape architect who designed PV Plaza to also create a modern, vibrant plaza downtown Minneapolis as part of this global revitalization effort of downtown Minneapolis. The project started in 1974, uh, August 74, and all the construction was completed in June 75, only 10 months, which is today, thinking about it, it's relatively impressive uh, to complete construction in 10 months. And the total cost of the project was about $3 million dollars from 1975, of course. Um, I will briefly talk about Paul Friedberg. So Paul Friedberg is a, a famous American landscape architect. He's from New York, and his company and his projects uh, were kind of prominent and important, especially after World War II. Uh, he created his company, Paul Friedberg and Associates. He's from New York. He was born in 1931, uh, he graduated from the School of Architecture from the Cornell University in 1954. And four years after, in 1958, he established and created his uh, landscape company, architectural uh, landscape company. He is known for various uh, sites, ex outdoor places, plaza, parks. But one of his most famous projects is probably the Jacobs Riss Plaza in New York, that project was completed in, in 1965. So this photo on the left-hand side is showing PV Plaza before rehabilitation. Uh, so most of you might be familiar with PV Plaza before, I would say, 2017. Um, it was still an interesting and high potential place, but it was a little sad uh, place. It was not well used or well activated. Um, there was some different maintenance, but as you can see, we have uh, a couple of key features include uh, the lower pool that is kind of occupying the center of the plaza. It is um, a roughly rectangular pool that is 140 by 200 feet, and it's uh, 10 feet, recessed 10 feet below the street level. And there are a couple of different components that I will uh, walk you through a little bit later. 
But as we, as we look at these photos, uh, one of the key or the most unique and significant added value that Paul Friedberg uh, introduced with the design of this plaza is that he kind of introduced a, a hybrid between the traditional American green space with the European hard spaces. So as you can see, we still have some green spaces, and that's why it's, it can be seen or called as a, as a park plaza or urban uh, plaza, because it's not only made of green spaces, but also some modern hardscape elements, mostly made of concrete, but also some metals, and uh, strong rectilinear geometrical shapes uh, that were at different levels and different elevations. So that's probably the, the unique and interesting twist that Paul Fringer introduced, is that combination of the traditional American green space with the European hard spaces. A couple of additional photos. Those are, again, our pre-photos from before the rehabilitation of PV Plaza. So this photo was taken from the lower pool. As you can see, that's kind of the, the center, the body of, of the plaza. And around the plaza, there is an interesting sequence of landscape terraces at various levels. And those terraces are organized all around the pool. As I mentioned earlier, the pool is recessed, and we can keep that in mind, because that was one of the main challenges that the project team has to, has to address, was how to provide access to that lower pool that is recessed by about 10 feet below the street level. As you can see, we have those different levels of artscape elements, we have very strong rectilinear elements. This is evident as we look at those main fountains, look at the coping and at the concrete of the fountain elements, and then, of course, the central plaza in the, in the center. As you may know, so this is in, in dry condition, so the pool could be drained for uh, gathering spaces, but also some special events. Um, I've not been able to attend or to participate because that was a couple of years ago, but I, I do know that those spaces were used, uh, and still today now that PV has been rehabilitated, uh, Orchestra Hall, the neighbor uh, on the block, are organizing some summer events during the summer, and I also highly recommend if you have never been, but they have a music festival, jazz festivals, and they occupy portion of PV Plaza, which is very nice. Uh, there are also some, there used to be some ice rink, occupying PV Plaza a couple of years ago. So there is also a very interesting multi-use uh, that PV Plaza has been occupying to, again, reactivate and bring people together in downtown Minneapolis and, and frankly, in the entire city of Minneapolis. But a couple of key, key features. So we talked about the concrete. The water is another main aspect. Of course, those photos are without water, but I will show you afterwards a couple of photos when the fountains have been rehabilitated, that water is one of the other key elements of PV Plaza. So we have the concrete and the water, the fountains, and then as you can see on those photos, we have those uh, vertical elements. Those are metal, uh, hollow, stainless steel canisters that bring additional verticality to the site. They have like a bronze-looking color. That's not the original color, and I will talk more about those later on. Um, but the water fountains with those vertical elements, that's a key element. We talked about the concrete, which is most of the material that you can see on those photos is concrete. Uh, we have some pavers, brick pavers. Uh, there are exposed aggregate pavers. As we talked about all the different concrete elements that are featured at PV Plaza, as I mentioned earlier, so we have those fountain elements. We have the coping, like at the perimeter of the fountains. Uh, and we have a range of other elements. There are some retaining, mall, retaining walls, excuse me. There are some concrete bollards. Some of them have light fixtures. There are some, what do we call, lily pads. Uh, those are some of those elements that you can see here at the bottom left uh, photo, where now kids can, can play and creating some cool features. The runnels, of course. There are some bridges and some runnels. We talked about the water. Um, so the two main elements, concrete water, but there are also additional key design elements at PV Plaza. One of them is, of course, the vegetation. Historically, uh, vegetation was uh, trees, uh, masses of evergreen turf and uh, shrubs, excuse me, and turf. Some of those trees uh, have been replaced and added over the history of PV Plaza. But vegetation, and there is a canopy, interesting canopy along 12th Street, that is also a key element of PV Plaza as part of the landscape design. So we have vegetation. We also have uh, multi-light multi, uh, 
lighting element and lighting systems. Um, you might see them at night. There are some very interesting uh, pendant can lights in the trees. Uh, those have been retained and rehabilitated. But there are other lighting systems throughout PV Plaza. Uh, there are some uh, lighting systems in the, in the fountains. There are some niche lighting. Uh, there are some uh, tall light poles that also have some light fixtures at the top of those light poles. And some of the bollards, the concrete and the metal bollards, do also incorporate some uh, lighting elements. So light is also a way to, is part of the design of PV Plaza and is introducing some additional features, especially at night. We also have historic site furnishing. Uh, site furnishing includes some seating elements, but also some uh, freestanding and wall-mounted metal handrails. Um, the seating, I will talk a little bit more about the seating, but uh, historically there were uh, some freestanding wood seating cubes that you can still see right now. Uh, with those were rehabilitated and new seating cubes were also added to the site and there are also uh, wall-mounted hung benches, also made of wood. But additional site furniture, so we talked about seating elements, uh, we have the handrails, there are uh, concrete bollards and concrete trash receptacles, there are uh, light poles, and there's also some uh, signage elements that are present at PV Plaza. Now, bringing us back to the more recent past, um, PV Plaza is a long, long-term project. It all started in 2010. Um, and what happened? So in 2010, uh, following the 2010 legislative session, a $2 million uh, deed grant was awarded to the city of Minneapolis uh, to partially fund the rehabilitation of a plaza. In addition to that $4 million matching uh, from the city and another $4 million from private donations. So we are looking at a total envelope of roughly $10 million uh, for uh, this project. Because we, the project was involving some state money, $4 million uh, state bond, uh, per Minnesota State 138, uh, that requires uh, review by the Minnesota State History Preservation Office, and this is called Section 138. Don't have to remember that terminology, and I will talk a bit more about the meaning of that uh, compliance review and the impact on the project and the design process especially. But because of because state money was used in this project, it triggered some preservation uh, requirements, I may say. In 2011, uh, the city filed a permit to demolish uh, PV Plaza and re completely replace PV Plaza with a new modern plaza. There are different concepts that were explored. Uh, this is one example of a, of a new uh, plaza that was considered. Um, of course, there are always pros and cons of demolishing versus uh, reusing an existing structure. Uh, but one year later, in 2012, uh, Preservation Alliance of Minnesota, or the PAM, which today is also better known as RITOS, they filed a lawsuit uh, to prevent the demolition of uh, PV Plaza. Uh, different addition tools were used. One of them, uh, which does not prevent demolition, but it makes it more difficult or complex, is... Um, a, national, a nomination was prepared to list the sites in the National of, uh, Register of Historic Places, and that happened in 2013. And the National Register can be seen as the nation's database or listing of sites, buildings, and structures that are worthy of preservation and reuse. If a building is listed in the National Register, technically it does not prevent you from altering or demolishing it, but there are additional review layers that are involved if you want to alter or demolish those sites. So 2013, PV Plaza was listed in the National Register under criterion C for significance in landscape architecture. And this is mostly relinked to uh, the oeuvre of Paul Friedberg, the designer of PV Plaza. On a side note, uh, in 2014, one year after the listing of PV Plaza, Orchestra Hall, they extended a part of their building, which was we can see now from uh, Nikonet uh, Mall. And in 2015, additional uh, reports and historical documentation were produced to better document the existing conditions and the features to support future planning. It was a kind of a planning tool to support the reuse of PV Plaza. All that to say... The plaza was not demolished, it was preserved and reused. 
And that happened between 2017 to 2019. And I will show you the different tools, the timeline, and the phases that were undertaken to go from planning all the way up to uh, construction between 2017 and 2019. A couple of nice photos um, bring us back to uh, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. Those are very nice black and white, but also colored photos uh, showing you, especially look at the, at the low pool in the middle. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's a low, low pool, a reflecting pool that could be drained to organize and accommodate some uh, gathering spaces or events. As you can see here, for example, in this condition, the water was drained so that people could enjoy and use the bottom of the pool as a plaza. This brings us closer to the more recent past. Now we are back to 2017. And the key challenge for the city and other stakeholders is to answer this question. How are we able to reuse the plaza, make it accessible to the public, make it a vibrant, welcoming place for everyone, while still being mindful about the character, the design, the materials, and the spatial organization of PV Plaza? So this is a very fine balance that may contradict each other uh, to be able to meet accessibility goals, but at the same time being able to make sure that the plaza still reads as historic plaza, that those key feature and design elements are still being preserved and maintained so that us, when we're walking, and also future generations, that they still have a, retain a sense of what was the original design created by Paul Friedberg. Those are the four main tools that I would like to talk about today in terms of how did we get how did we answer that question frankly and those four main tools are first looking at precedents uh the stakeholders the city of minneapolis has been looking at other plazas modern plazas that have been designed uh, just to give some additional ideas i will be talking about this the hsr or historic structures report this is a very common uh, tool for uh preservation planning purposes that is being developed Stakeholder engagement, that's a, that's a big one on this project uh, that we should remember. That's a very important component of the project and the success of PV Plaza. And then I will uh, also show the, the full timeline of the project. But let's start with precedence. Uh, typical features of urban plaza include water, water fountains, similar to the original fountains at PV Plaza. We have those uh, geometric hardscape and landscaping elements, terraces, and then sunken elements. So we are thinking and we have to deal with different levels and elevations, concrete or other masonry materials, pavers, and generally speaking, a relatively limited palette of, of materials. Common problems associated with plava, plazas and parks. Uh, sometimes it's challenging to ensure that the plaza would be maintained on the long term. It can be it can be tricky. Uh, climate, environment, and seasons. Think of, of think especially in our climate in Minnesota. Think about the snow, uh, uh, snow removal. Uh, stewardship uh, can sometimes be also unclear on some of those projects. You have ownership, stewardship, maintenance, the evolution of the use. As we all know, over time, over the generations, the the needs of the city evolve. Uh, people being downtown, changing, the needs are evolving. And mo most importantly, the last one, the lack of accessibility. Especially if you introduce some um, terraces and second areas, you need to incorporate and be mindful about accessibility requirements uh, in order to make sure that most, if not all, of those spaces are accessible to people with disabilities. Second item is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Historic Structure Report, or HSR. So this is a, a common planning tool that is being used for uh, preservation efforts. It provides a record of the history of a site. The goal is also to document the existing conditions. First, to identify the materials that remain, because over the history of a site or a building, alterations could have impacted the original materials. Uh, this is the case at PV Plaza, some of those retaining walls were a modern addition from 97, 98. They were not original to the construction of PV Plaza. Some of the trees were removed, so there were some changes. 
So the goal is to understand those the existing conditions and identifying what is original versus what was added at some point. And the purpose of an HSR is also to serve as a basis, as a tool to uh, support f further uh, planning efforts. It's a way to prepare the next step in some way and inform the building ownership, but also the architectural team, structural, and the multidisciplinary team. Generally speaking, uh, producing a HSR is, involves a, a project team that has multidisciplinary skills that can incorporate a landscape architect in this case because it's an exterior site. Landscape architecture was very was essential. Architecture, structure, mechanical, plumbing, electrical, all those different components are uh, incorporated. So we have a combination of historical data, but also physical evidence. There is a physical survey that is being done to, again, assess the existing conditions, the materials that are in place, but also their conditions. Some of the concrete at PV Plaza was damaged. There was some cracking, there was some staining. So the goal is also to identify those deterioration patterns and then provide some treatment recommendations that are compatible. Uh, for example, if there is some graffiti on concrete, you could sandblast the concrete, um, but it has the potential to damage the appearance of the concrete. So on a historic site or a structure or historic building, we would never recommend using <laughs> sandblasting because we know it has the potential to damage the appearance, uh, the finish of the concrete. So making sure that we are giving the right tools, um, also from a maintenance standpoint, to make sure that the building, the structure can be retained, cleaned, and maintained without damaging these rig materials. Standards for rehabilitation. That's also another major item. If you remember earlier today, I mentioned because some uh, state bonds were used to partially fund this project that triggered um, consultation with the Minnesota State District Preservation Office and review by uh, what is also called SHPO. So the project has to comply with preservation standards, and there are four main types of standards. There are standards for rehabilitation, renovation, rest restoration, and reconstruction. For this specific project, uh, the standards for rehabilitation were applied. And what does so rehabilitation means that you are altering, a, in this case, a site to accommodate a new use or to provide accessibility while still maintaining portions and for as much as possible of the historic materials and character of the spaces. So a restoration is slightly different. That its restoration is keeping the original historic design and restoring to the original appearance. That was not a good fit for PV Plaza. For, for this project, rehabilitation was a better fit, allowing some alteration in order to make it work from an accessibility, safety, and reuse standpoint while still retaining the original character of the site. So standard for rehabilitation, those are the 10 standards that the project team has to navigate as they plan for and design for the rehabilitation of the plaza. Uh, I would advise you to look at the, the red bold text. <laughs> That's the most important one for PV Plaza. I will not read all of them, but I wanted to just highlight a couple of them that are the key ones uh, that the project has to keep in mind. Number one, a property shall be used for its historic purpose or be placed in a new use that requires minimal changes. Number two, the removal of historic materials or alteration of features and spaces that characterize a property should be avoided. Number five, distinctive features, finishes, and construction techniques shall be preserved. Number six, deteriorated historic features shall be repaired rather than replaced. That's an important one. You have to repair if you can repair, you should repair. If it's beyond repair, then you can replace. But replacement is not a standard first uh, tool to consider. And last but not least, going down to the list number nine, new additions, exterior alteration, or related new construction shall not destroy historic materials. The new work shall be differentiated from the old and shall be compatible with the old or the existing historic. So those 10 main rules are kind of the governing rules that the project team has incorporated in the design uh, in order to uh, create a design that would be suitable, uh, compatible, respecting the historic character of the building. Again, because state bonds were used. 
As we talked about those key features, uh, I briefly talked about them earlier, but I wanted to summarize them by using those nine photos. So this is a kind of a print screen taken from the historic structural report that was prepared for PV Plaza. So those are the, the key elements at PV Plaza can be regrouped in those nine categories. We have vegetation, so we talked about historically, we had trees, um, masses, areas of shrubs and turf. <laughs> Water features, the lower pool, the fountains with the canisters, the spatial organization. We have those interconnected spaces that are connected by actual physical elements. We have some ramps, uh, some steps, and then our visual connection as well. The structures, mostly concrete, to some extent metal, and then some brick pavers. The lighting elements, as I mentioned. We have some fountain lighting, a niche lighting, the banner lights, and the pendant lights in the trees. Side furnishing, think of the seating, the wood benches, the wood seating cubes. Added elements, uh, so that category, that's the bottom left photo here. Those by added elements, we mean elements that were added to the site that are non-historic, non-original to the construction. And those were mostly uh, planters and retaining walls. And that's a good example of here, uh, a planter that is not original to 1975. It was added at the end of the 21st century. And then the views, the vistas. It's um, If you're familiar with PV Plaza, as you walk and navigate through that three-dimensional space, uh, the views and the vistas are very interesting, especially from the different um, um, areas of, uh, or districts of PV Plaza. As we talked about districts, um, PV Plaza is rather complex. And um, <clears throat> the project team and the architect, we have had those conversations, and also during the construction phase, um, it is a complex three-dimensional site. <laughs> um, and to bring some rational elements at PV Plaza as part of the HSR effort, um, the researchers split or subdivided historic, uh, the historic site into six districts. They each have their own specific features. The main district is the one in the middle. Uh, that's the lower pool. Again, this is kind of the center key space of the plaza. And then there are five additional districts that are at the perimeter of the lower pool. We have the upper plaza here uh, on Nicolette and 11th Street. We have Nicolette Terraces that now accommodates a ramp to provide accessibility. We have the top left here in purple. That's the main fountain district. We have 12th Street Terraces along 12th Street uh, across um, where we are right now. And then the yellow one here is uh, the concert hall uh, promenade along orchestra hall. Those are a couple of photos showing, um, representing those uh, six different districts. This is a photo that is showing uh, the upper plaza uh, across the WCCO. We are here looking at those main fountains um, across what, uh, across the church. This is an area um, on Nicolette Mall. That's a view from Nicolette Mall here as well. Here, this is a view taken from the lower pool looking towards Nicolette Mall. Um, as I mentioned earlier, some of those concrete features were damaged. So this is an example of a uh, cracked concrete element, uh, concrete coping, a nice view from the lower pool with a close-up view of the brick pavers at the lower pool. The three-dimensional concrete of the fountain systems that you can see in those two photos, and then here another nice photo of the lower pool. Accessibility. Um, the main goals of the city, so we are still 2017, the key goals of the city and other project stakeholders as part of this reuse project were uh, a combination of goals, I would say. One was to reuse the space, bring it back to the, to the community and the city. But providing accessibility was also a key requirement, making sure that it would be a viable and welcoming space to everyone. Repairing concrete, utility upgrades, and old mechanical systems, plumbing to make sure that the water fountains would be working efficiently. So this... Uh, schematic plan is showing uh, 
a study that was explored at some point to provide accessibility to the site. This is not the final um, reuse or the final design of PV Plaza, but it's just showing a couple of schemes that were explored to provide accessibility to the majority of the site at PV Plaza. And you can see those arrows in red are showing potential path to provide accessibility to uh, different areas of PV Plaza. We have one access here on Nicolet Mall, one here around the extension of Orchestra Hall, and then here at the opposite side uh, along 12th Street. Stakeholder engagement, that was a critical component in the success of this project. Uh, as you can see, it's a decent uh, list of stakeholder en engagement. Um, many people were involved, or many groups. Uh, I will not list them all, but a couple of, they're all important, but just a couple of them that I wanted to highlight. Uh, we have Preservation Alliance of Minnesota, or RITOS, Preserve Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota Council on Disability, Minneapolis Neighborhood and Community Relations, uh, the police department was involved, mostly for a uh, safety standpoint, to make sure that the new design would be safe. As I mentioned earlier today, the State Historic Preservation Office, from a compliance standpoint, the Minneapolis Heritage Preservation Commission at the local level for local preservation approvals, city council member and elected officials, city staff, and of course, neighborhood, the residents and the public. That was also another essential component. And the stakeholder engagement translating into uh, a communication plan or stakeholder engagement plan. There were three main meetings that were organized in 2017, from February to April 2017, in parallel with design development. And those three meetings follow kind of a, a, sh a funnel process from talking about the, the big picture of the project at meeting one, going down into more specifics of the project. So the first uh, scope during the first meeting were to talk about the overall special, spatial organization of the plaza, accessibility, which was key uh, to provide accessibility to the site, and then water features. Moving down to the second meeting, public safety, reactivating the space, and lighting elements. And then the focus of the third meeting was to uh, talk about stormwater management, how to repair and restore the concrete, furniture, and plantings. We talked about accessibility. So on this um, three-dimensional rendering, on dark here around the perimeter of PV Plaza, that uh, hatch here in dark green is showing uh, an accessible area, but at the street level only. And then... In the lighter green here, um, in the middle of PV Plaza, or I should say along Orchestra Hall, that's another accessible path, but it's within PV Plaza. And as you can see, those spaces are only connected by mostly steps, which we know steps are not accessible. <laughs> um, there, is a, there was, there used to be uh, an access point here, but that access did not meet code requirements for accessibility. So that was one of the big challenges. How do we move from the dark green to the light green um, and how do we ensure that most that frankly everyone can access the majority of the site that was probably the biggest challenge that the project team has to navigate uh, for uh, this project while again minimizing the removal of historic materials and making sure that any new construction on pv plaza would be compatible with the character of the site Going back to this slide, so if you remember the previous photos, there is the lower pool has a concrete coping. So there is kind of a drop here at the edge of the concrete. And I'm going to show you uh, close up details of that specific area here where we have the transition at the perimeter of the, of the pool. These are um, different conditions. And if we look at the first one, um, which is kind of the existing historic condition. So we have the bottom of the pool, um, original water level, and then this is what I just showed you on the previous photo, that concrete coping. Um, so we have a drop of about two feet, uh, according to that detail, if the detail is correct. Uh, but it's a, it's a significant drop. Um, and then the entire project team looked at different alternate options. How can we bring accessibility and meeting code requirements? So some of those alternate options were 
um, partially infilling the pool to frankly reduce the drop. Uh, another condition was to fill level the pool and to match the elevation of the coping or to go even above and to match the elevation of the adjacent terraces. So those are different options that were explored. There are other options that were explored, but those are just a few of them that were explored. And each have their pros and cons. Again, navigating accessibility versus how are we changing the original character of the space. If you are infilling the pool, you slightly lose that drop and the special relationship with adjacent terraces because the pool becomes less obvious since we are infilling the pool with a new material. However, it might be a very sensitive way to provide accessibility to the pool. Accessibility. Before we started the project, about 7,500 square feet of the site were partially accessible. And now, today, I believe we are over 20,000 square feet of fully accessible. <laughs> so this is a major improvement in terms of accessibility. Uh, frankly, the majority of the site that is not a fountain or a step is accessible right now. So I think, that's, I think the architectural team did an amazing job at increasing accessibility to the greatest extent possible, while again being retaining as much as the existing historic materials as possible. And there are, uh, to reach this goal, three additional, three new ramps were created on site. One shorter ramp here um, on Nicolet and 11th Street. And the purpose of this ramp is to provide access to the upper terrace here. We have another uh, set of two ramps that are kind of connected uh, along Nicolet Mall. And this ramp provide access to uh, this side of the lower pool. And then we have another ramp here uh, on the other side, closer to the uh, concert hall promenade that also provide access to the plaza from 12th Street. So those are probably the, one of the biggest new alteration or impact to the site was to add those three ramps. That's one big, big change from a visual standpoint. Uh, another big change is, is the pool. Uh, the level of the pool was raised to provide accessibility. So those are probably from a visual standpoint. If you walk on Nicolet Mall and you compare the previous PV and the new PV Plaza, the most obvious changes would be leveling the pool and adding those ramps. Timeline. Um, planning is, uh, timing for planning is essential to make sure that the project uh, stays on track, that the project team is meeting those deadlines and big milestones. Um, we're not here anymore, uh, <laughs> but that's a slide that was used during those meetings uh, as part of the stakeholder engagement. Um, and generally speaking, for the ones who are not familiar with construction projects, uh, the design would progress over different steps. There are three main steps. One is called schematic design, the second one is design development, and then the third one is construction documents. That's kind of the final step where um, all the final design and details are finalized. Um, so that's from a the design and construction standpoint timeline. And then below this line, uh, you have the timeline reflecting uh, the, those three meetings that I mentioned earlier uh, as part of the stakeholder engagement process with the stakeholders. In each of those meetings, there are very specific items that were discussed as part of those meetings. And those are the three meetings that happened uh, between February and April of uh, 2017. An additional layer included uh, reviews by the State Historic Preservation Office. Um, so there are three main steps in the design, schematic development and construction documents. Uh, at the end of each of those steps, uh, an application was submitted to the State Historic Preservation Office uh, as part of the compliance uh, process, and they had the opportunity to review the design and share some comments at 30%, 60%, and 90% of the design. After the stakeholder engagement process, um, it was determined that the project had an effect or an impact on the historic character of the site. Uh, which is also called an adverse effect. That's a te technical terminology. Um, again, state funding was used, so the project has to go through a compliance process called Section 138, and the purpose of that process is to determine 
if your project has an impact or an adverse effect on the historic site. Here, it was the answer to that question was yes. In order to provide accessibility, there is an adverse effect to uh, the historic construction. And then in that case, uh, the project team was able to mitigate the adverse effect. So different tools were used to mitigate the adverse effect. It's kind of a, in some way it can be seen as balancing the impact on the project. And one of those tools was the HSR, the Historic Structure Report, interpretive signage. Um, now it might be more difficult to see, but if there is a very nice bronze 3D model along Nicolette, that's also part of the mitigation effort. Uh, so the project team worked on interpretive signage and the 3D model showing how PV Plaza was before the start of the project is a way, again, to mitigate the impact of the project. Moving to construction. Uh, so now I'm going to walk you through PV Plaza. Uh, we are not on PV Plaza, so it's kind of a virtual walkthrough that I will be doing. So I will be showing the existing photo on the left, the after photo on the right, and then just to help you identify where you are, I added a little key plan with red dot showing where the photo was taken. So we are starting our virtual walkthrough uh, at the upper terrace um, here. So this is across uh, WW. Uh, WCCO. This is the upper plaza. Um, as you can see, limited changes from a visual standpoint, uh, pavement, vegetation, and then additional uh, wood seating cubes were added uh, to this area. And this is a way to kind of mimic the historical design, uh, because historically there were, and there still are, wood seating cubes at PV Plaza, so it was a compatible alteration to add additional wood seating cubes that are very similar to the historic ones. Moving along Nicolette Mall, uh, this is a good example of a non-historic alteration that happened in 1997-98 where we had uh, those non-historic uh, texture concrete block plantings that are unsympathetic <laughs> to the site um, and the project team was very creative and very mindful about where can we locate those ramps. And that area gave an opportunity to the project team because it was already altered, it was non-historic, it gave an opportunity to the project team to check the box of how can we provide accessibility while being mindful about the location and the impact. Um, so that's one of the ramps that was added to the site along Nikonet Mall. And this is a, a photo that was taken during the construction. So you can see um, how that element was uh, incorporated along Nicolette Mall. You will notice, uh, so keep that in mind for future slides, um, the, appearance, the appearance of the concrete, uh, which is very specific at PV Plaza. Um, so the project team spent quite some time in finding the right texture and pattern for uh, the formwork, the wood formwork that was used to cast those walls in place. Uh, to mimic the existing appearance of the historic concrete. Moving along, additional photos from the same area. So we are still at that ramp along Nicolette Mall, but this time looking uh, towards the, the pool. So additional photo here before condition showing those uh, alterations that were made. Those were not original um, with those plantings uh, and some of those uh, terraces. And this is an after photo showing the new ramp uh, fully completed here, looking at the pool. Now we are moving in the middle of PV Plaza at the lower pool. This is a pre-existing condition. So you will notice we have that 24 inch drop uh, between the coping, the concrete coping and the brick pavers. And this is the new uh, plaza. So the big change here is, of course, we the, the pool was leveled to match the adjacent elevation. That's a major uh, change. And it gives the opportunity for everyone now, even including people with disability, to access the space. And I will talk a little bit more about how this was achieved. So the bottom of the pool featured um, historic brown brick pavers. Um, that was one of the items that was uh, discussed with the stakeholder during the stakeholder engagement process with the different stakeholder, including the Minnesota uh, Status Preservation Office, 
on finding a way to, again, provide accessibility while being mindful and keeping as much of the materials as possible. Different options were explored. If you remember, I showed you those four edge details. Uh, the select, selected option is the, is the fourth one, which includes keeping most of, of the brick uh, below to remain, adding some short concrete walls that were used as uh, support to carry a new elevated concrete platform finished with granite. So if we go back to the previous photo, so that's the, the finished appearance, as you will be able to see. Well, now there is some snow, but in the summer, you will see the exposed granite. But below the granite, we have those uh, short concrete walls that are supporting concrete platform finished with granite panels. So this is a great solution for two reasons. First, uh, the impact to the historic brick pavers was limited to only removing bricks for uh, creating those concrete walls. So it's a very limited impact. Um, some brick elements were also locally uh, removed to upgrade the drainage system of the pool. And it's also uh, in some way a re reversible uh, as um, design intervention. In 20 years or in 50 years, if desired, the entire system can be removed and we can restore the historic spatial relationship of the pool by patching and adding brick pavers that would match the historic and no one would ever know that at some point uh, the pool was leveled. This is another photo uh, during construction uh, that we took. Uh, so you can see here, it was almost complete. Uh, you don't see the brick pavers anymore. You also don't see the, those concrete short walls because they are concealed by the brick, uh, the, sorry, excuse me, the concrete platform finished with uh, granite. Selection of the granite was also an interesting component uh, because again, you want to be, it's always finding a, a fine line between, between not creating a false sense of history. We want to make sure that it looks contemporary, that intervention, that people don't think that it's original to 1975, but at the same time, it has to be compatible. So uh, the project team also spent quite some time in, and within as part of the stakeholder engagement process to determine what would be a suitable material um, and I was able to, uh, with the architect, we also reviewed the, the quarry, the, the granite, to make sure that it would be a compatible material. Um, so that was an interesting process. And the final um, complete stage, uh, which is the most rewarding component when everything is complete and giving it back to the community. Um, those photos were taken at the ribbon cutting event at, as I believe, summer 2019, I think. Um, and today it's very nice. If you haven't been yet there yet, I would highly recommend uh, going during the summer. Um, people enjoy, uh, children, uh, dogs, everyone enjoys uh, the view, but also playing. It's, ac it's accessible. I've seen people even skateboarding, even if it might not be <laughs> meant to skateboard, but uh, people play, run. Uh, so it's a very cool space uh, right now. As we continue to walk through the site, now we are here at the district, which was that purple color on the slide. So that's called the, the, the main fountain district, um, where we have, the, of course, the concrete fountain, but also those uh, vertical metal canisters. Uh, this is also a dramatic before and after photo, um, before rehabilitation and after rehabilitation. So the concrete here was cleaned uh, because it was stained, as you can imagine, with the water, but also environmental staining. Uh, the concrete was a little yellowish, uh, so the concrete was cleaned, and we did some, uh, the project team did some, some test samples to make sure that the cleaning technique would not damage the concrete, to remove the, the dirt, but not damage the concrete. Um, and of course, what we don't see here is all the, the utility upgrade the plumbing system that has been uh, updated in order to bring those fountains back to life. The concrete. Uh, remember, in addition to the water, the concrete is one of the most important key feature at PV Plaza. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about the concrete. So this is a close-up photo of the, of the historic concrete at one of those uh, fountains. Um, it is exposed aggregate. 
and it has some sort of a, a vertical pattern, and that patterns correspond to the wood planks that were used to build those walls. So those concrete walls were cast in place, and how they did it was to uh, use some wood planks, you keep them in place, you pour the concrete between the wood planks, and when the concrete has set, is dry, cured, you can remove the planks, and then you have your, uh, your construction. Um, so you can kind of see the, the wood grain in the concrete if you have a closer look, which is interesting. Um, and there are also some, there was kind of an offset between each of those planks. So if you go to PV Plaza, you will see that this is not a flat surface. Uh, the vertical pattern is also because there was kind of a ridge between each of those, of, of those wood planks. And the project team and the contractor spent also quite some time uh, in trying to find the right way to replicate that pattern again for the, the new walls of the new concrete, the new retaining walls to make sure that they would look very similar to the existing historic construction. So we did a, quite a few mock-ups with those planks, um, putting the concrete, removing them, and then having a look, comparing the new construction with the historic to make sure that it would match and be very close and similar to the historic appearance. So that's before, when the concrete is not dry yet. When you remove the planks, this is what you see. Uh, so now we have the new concrete, and as I mentioned earlier, we have the, the, the vertical pattern with those uh, ridges and uh, kind of the, the imprint of the wood planks that were used that is visible in the concrete. So those are two photos showing uh, freshly poured uh, concrete uh, ramps at PV Plaza. And you can see the offset of those planks here at the top of the wall. Moving to uh, the edge of the main fountain district. Uh, as I mentioned, water is an important aspect at PV Plaza, but the uh, hollow metal uh, stainless steel canisters are also very important. Uh, the color is also very different, as you can see. Um, I've always known those with that brown stain <laughs> before the project, um, but this is not the original color. Uh, they are actually uh, made of stainless steel, uh, and again, because of long-term surface corrosion and potentially chemicals, uh, there was some patina on the stainless steel that has to be removed to restore the original appearance of those canisters. And we uh, were able, the project team and the, with the architect were able to uh, very easily, which was kind of a good news, uh, to easily remove that staining without damaging or etching or damaging the uh, canisters. Moving along to uh, the district along 12th Street, 12th Street terraces. Photo of before rehabilitation compared to after. Um, you will notice now that there are more of those uh, exposed aggregate concrete pavers, which are one of the uh, essential elements in terms of paving at PV Plaza. Uh, some of them were missing, some of them are relocated, uh, but the project team did a good job at uh, looking at the historical photos and historical drawings to understand where those historical exposed aggregate pavers were installed and trying to reinstall them at the historic location matching the historical design as shown on the photos and the drawings. Some of them were missing or broken, um, so we reused as much as possible, but some of them had to be replaced, uh, and those were replaced in kind. I think that was one of the most challenging <laughs> aspects, uh, although it's a small element, but uh, finding a, a good color for the cement matrix, the aggregate mix that would match the historic to the best as we could was pretty uh, challenging. It took quite some time uh, to find the right uh, pavers. Uh, and right now, I think if you don't, you can barely see the difference. So I think it's a, it's a nice, um, it was a successful process for the team uh, to be able to find a, a replica that would be very close to the historic pavers. Another element, you remember those wood seating cubes um, at the upper terrace? Those, are, those were new wood seating cubes here that I showed on here. So those are new wood seating cubes, but the design of those uh, seating cubes is based on the historical existing wood seating cubes that we can see on site. And those are the ones that I'm showing on the next slide. 
This is a historic original wood ceiling tube. Uh, those were retained and repaired. And they're, we can still now use them. Right now during the summer, uh, those are um, there. Some of the wood was damaged, as you can imagine. Um, wood uh, under exterior condition, um, they were damaged. There was some splitting, some cracking, some pieces of wood were missing. So the project team and the contractor worked on repairing and fixing those wood ceiling cubes uh, while still retaining the exterior appearance and finished appearance of those cubes. It would probably have been easier to paint them uh, from a maintenance standpoint, but that would not have been compatible because originally those wood ceiling cubes were uh, unpainted, unfinished with exposed wood. Um, I will not go into the, the details, uh, but I just wanted to show you uh, the process for patching those holes uh, where the wood was missing. Um, the contractor used kind of a, some sort of a paste element uh, that can be stained to match the color of the wood uh, as much as possible. And we went on site and we looked at different uh, mixes of colors. And those are the ones that you can see here on the, on the left photo looking at the different colors, um, and it's kind of a, a way to mix some pigments to match and get as close uh, as possible to the historic color of, of the wood. Uh, and right now, this is the uh, a photo of the wood ceiling cube after patching and repair. Um, and that brings me to a question for the audience. Can you, so that cube has been repaired, but can you see the patches? Where are the patches? Can you find one? Knots, the knots, the wood knot. Sorry, can you say that? The wood knot. So, do, yeah, you're right. So, those ones are actually uh, plugs. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Those are plugs um, that are concealing the, the bolts, securing the, the wood cube to the concrete base below. And those ones were missing and were replaced. So, that's a good point. Uh, if you look at this area here, and I know it's a little dark, but this is an, an area where the wood was patched. Uh, so that area here is was infilled with one of that patching material, matching the color of the wood. Uh, similar with this crack here was infilled. This one here, that's a patch. But it's great. I'm glad that it's hard for you to see those patches because the goal, again, is to make sure that those patches are invisible, almost. <laughs> And this is, again, as I mentioned, uh, kind of the, the biggest success or goal for any of those historical projects is to bring back the, those sites to the public, to the community, to the neighborhood uh, for the, hopefully the years and, who knows, centuries uh, to come. Uh, so I want to finish by showing a couple of photos, uh, or this photo from uh, taken in the summer, where people, again, are enjoying the fountains with the pool being raised, um, the vegetation, the site finishing, and so on. And this is a photo at night, um, also very nice, uh, with the light fixtures um, at the fountains, uh, the light poles, but also here, um, the fountains along 12th Street. So this, is, uh, this terminates my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Um, thank you for your time. And I would be happy to answer any questions or comments that you might have. Thank you. Uh, what was the depth of the water originally and after refurbishing? Oof, that's a good question. <laughs> um, if, and we, I'm fortunate because the architect uh, who was leading this project, she's in the audience today. I don't want to put her on the spot, but if you don't mind, Laura. At the water depth, uh, so it was 12, 24 inches from the top of the coping to the bottom the pool, 10 inches of water. And then the final scrim depth was a quarter inch of water. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> uh, a segment that's not often seen using this area are homeless people using water for bathing, for washing. I, I know in the summer there are porta potties put out there on on the street, but what what accommodations were thought of for them in trying to build this, design it? That's a good question. Um, I will point 
Laura, again, I don't want to put you on the spot, but maybe you might know more than I do. <laughs> That's probably one of the hardest questions is how to accommodate all of the different people who are using the plaza, especially people in such a vulnerable population. The porta potties was a, a very strong desire by the city. They felt very strongly about adding those porta potties. Uh, in terms of bathing in the fountains, I mean that's discouraged. I mean that's there's there's not a lot you can do about that um, aside from the DID um, ambassadors will try to guide people from entering the the water depths and the fountain areas. Are the ambassadors out early in the morning when the sun's up? I'm not sure what time they start their rounds. I, I think it's around like 7 a.m. Mm -hmm. Where I've seen them on the mall. Yep. Thank you, Laura. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't quite capture. Uh, you had a, a symbol of the National Park Service, so this is a project they they adopted, PV Plaza, and made it part of the national. Interior Department, they put in some money. The other thing I remember quite well, being a political person, the city council fought this tooth and nail. They they basically wanted to just, I don't know what they were going to do with the space, but they had, they were really opposed. So did they, did they fight the, when they were, when the, when the remodel happened, were there a lot of I mean, once they were able, they were ordered by a, by a court to to do it, and I think as it was uh, it was uh, it, it, presumably perhaps it had always been in the national park thing, and they and that was part of what saved it. I don't know. Um, of course, there is the preservation the city has, but 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 the court ordered them. I mean, they if they had had their thing. It would have been paved over or whatever, you know. Uh, but uh, I'd be curious if they, even after being ordered, if they fought tooth and nail over certain improvements. You don't know. Perhaps you do know. That's a good question. Yeah. Uh, and I will try to answer to both components of your question. First, um, you are correct. So the symbol of the National Park Service is uh, related to the listing of PV Plaza in the National Register of Historic, Historic Places, excuse me, that happened in 2013. And that was partially in response to the uh, demolition permit that, frankly, that was applied. Um, so that was 2013. And then uh, the second component of your question, I would say, yes, I was not personally involved um, in those conversations, but I would say that, yes, it was... Um, those they had vivid conversations uh, between the different stakeholder um, team members, including city council. That is correct. I think I think in the uh, ten point list, one of the things in there was when repairs are made, they have to be made so that you can tell that they were repaired. Did I did I catch that right? Yes, so one of the, the standards implies that if a material is damaged or deteriorated, that you have to repair it first. That's kind of your prioritized list. I would say the first one is don't do anything. If it's in good condition, don't remove it. That's step number one. The second step is if a material is damaged or deteriorated, then you have to repair it using uh, materials that are compatible so that after the repair, it looks the same in terms of appearance, color, um, and also geometry, the profile and the dimensions. If it's beyond repair, for example, you cannot repair it or, it or it's missing, that's another option, then you can replace it. And then the best course of action would be to replace it in kind with exactly the same material, looking um, exactly the same as the historic. So if we go back to the, to the concrete, if a piece of concrete is missing or damaged and that it cannot be repaired, you can replace it, but you would want to replicate the same profile, the color, the appearance of all the different components of the concrete. So that includes the color, the aggregates, and the cement mat matrix. Is, is there also um, um, a desk for the, PV bill, for the PV plaza such that it can be roped off or sectioned off for um, parties or for 
weddings or banquets or anything like that down there, so the space can actually be rented. Is there, there, there is a facility for that? Okay, good. Yes. I, I want to make sure there's both extremes. Mm -hmm. Yes, so correct, good. yep. That's a good question. And yes, the space can be reused for various uh, events. Mm -hmm. I believe Green Minneapolis is still managing. Yep. Uh, so Green Minneapolis is the entity that is responsible for maintaining, but also managing uh, any use of PV Plaza in terms of events. Correct. Yeah. That answered one of my questions. But um, I was curious how Preserve Minneapolis got involved. And also the community engagement, the stakeholder engagement process, um, how, how you determined who would be involved in that. Mm -hmm. Yep, so that's a, another good question. And as part of the, to comply with the uh, legislator, and it's called uh, Statute 138, you have to invite stakeholder, uh, any potential stakeholder to, to the table, frankly. Um, and based on experience with other projects, it's a matter of your due diligence effort of identifying those stakeholders. Some of them are typical, like institution or reviewing agencies, like the cities, the neighbors, residents, and city service preservation office. Um, but then there are also notices that are being submitted to other um, parties or stakeholders, and they're required to respond within a set of time. I think it's 30 days, and they have to respond if they want to actively be engaged and participate. So it's a matter of inviting the stakeholders, then they have to respond and to confirm that they show an interest in the project, and if they say yes, then they will be invited to those uh, meetings as part of that stakeholder engagement process. So how did um, Preserve Minneapolis get involved in this whole project? And, and who did you were in charge of um, the budget of getting the money for the project? I will first let Dick from Preserve Minneapolis uh, answer your f first uh, component. As Quentin just said, Preserve Minneapolis was invited to be involved, as other obvious stakeholders were. And so I attended some of the meetings at the uh, courthouse. There I don't know how many dozens of design meetings to look at all these detailed things, wood, concrete, how it's going to be done, and so forth. Um, so, you know, it was just a matter of showing up and uh, putting in an opinion on what has been done. And then the design team takes all of that information t together and makes their decisions. Thank you, Dick. There were major renovations made in PP Plaza in the 21st century because the general feeling it, it wasn't working. Indeed, the mm -hmm. city council wanted to pave it over, abolish it. Yep. Are you happy now with what we have? Uh, or do you feel there are still major renovations and indeed in another tw 10 or 20 years we may have to again make a major change because it really isn't working all that well? That's a good question. Um, from a personal standpoint, um, I, I am very happy. I think it's a great project. <laughs> to me, it's a very nice and sen sensitive design. Of course, I'm biased because I was involved uh, during the project. Um, but to me, I would say that it's a very sensitive approach. And I think that the architect, um, Lara from Kunin Partners and her team, they did a great job at also seeing around the corner to kind of anticipate potential needs in the design. So it's a, it's a long-term uh, planning effort. Uh, and then from a maintenance standpoint, uh, um, a maintenance manual was also created for a Privy Plaza for a couple of reasons, but the main goal is to support maintenance of the plaza to inform uh, from a daily activity, day, uh, daily basis, how you retain, repair, and keep um, those building systems in place. Or if you see some de damage or deterioration, what should you do and who you should inform so that we can fix and repair those damages? 